ground troops in Iraq, Scottish independence, the Ukraine-Russia deal, and the Adrian Peter situation. I'm John Romero, and this is The Square Circle. Hello and welcome to The Square Circle. I'm your host, John Romero. Joining us today are PhD candidate James Hedrick, political consultant Leif Larson, Al Matei of topofthecircle.com, and Nick Zayas of Young Voices Advocates. Welcome, everybody. This week, there appeared to be some daylight between President Obama and the Pentagon on the question of ground troops in Iraq. The president reiterated that he would not put American boots on the ground again in Iraq, but both Joint Chiefs Chairman Martin Dempsey and Army Chief of Staff Ray Odierno left open the possibility of doing exactly that if airstrikes alone are insufficient to defeat the Islamic State. Now, Leif Larson, it's clear that President Obama's political considerations are in conflict with the strategic planning of the operation, but which one will eventually win out? I mean, we act as if this is a big surprise. I mean, his entire presidency has been in conflict with recommendations that he's received from his military experts. I the thing is, you can't blame the president. He's got two years left of his uh, in his term. He doesn't want to be a president that he, people will label as having got us into another ground war. So he's he's trying everything he can in order not to have that happen. Can we win in this conflict without troops on the ground or some form of troops on the ground, whether it be a coalition or something along those lines? No. Uh, we might be able to do it in in, in Iraq. Uh, we've we've been driving them out. We've been trying to get the forces in Iraq back into fighting form, if they can get into fighting form. Uh, but to get them out of Syria is going to require boots on the ground. I think the generals know that. They don't want to be labeled as having given the president bad information and have themselves go down in history as being the ones that were at fault here. Uh, so I think it, it, it's a catch-22 for the president. Either he can get us involved in another, you know, ground on uh, ground war in the Middle East, or he can bide his time until he's out of office and uh, just have a stalemate until the next person comes in and takes over the mess. Let's keep it on this side of the table, Nick. Your thoughts? I very much agree. It's it's kind of a it, he's between a rock and a hard place, and honestly, no, I don't think. Air power alone is going to do this, but whether whether boots on the ground are going to do it either is, or even make it worse, is still up in the air. So it's it's kind of a lose lose situation for everyone involved, and this is not a conflict that's going away easily, no matter what we do. So I'm not sure what the marginal value of any of of troops on the ground, regardless of what's going to happen. James, your thoughts. Um, back to the original question of, of who's going to win out. It's, it's it's not Truman MacArthur here. I mean, it's going to be the president's policy is going to win out. I mean, that's fine. I think that you've you've got a point that generals are going online to make sure, or going in public to make sure that they're on they're on record that that they need these troops on the ground. Uh, but I mean, we've heard that before, and we've done this before, and we've gotten into this thing before. I think the best idea is probably not to get ourselves into a situation in which it takes. Uh, ton of blood and treasure to get yourself back out. So blow them up, keep them away, use a lot of drones, basically follow public opinion on that case, drone strikes and airstrikes and, and leave it at that, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have tremendous air power superiority over ISIL. I mean, yes, sometimes the Republican echo chamber can look really stupid sometimes. When uh, a couple of weeks ago they alleged that ISIL people had gotten a hold of some multi-million dollar military jets were ready to, you know, ready to attack the to attack the allies. Then of course, when you think about it, um, good luck for any zealot to try and, and read all these um, uh, technologically superior um, instruments in English. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got, uh, you know, you, you, the zealotry has no match for mm -hmm. technology and precision, I don't think. 
and it's going to be. I think you're making. I mean, there's there's a good point here on risk on risk reward, uh, drone strikes, special operations, airstrikes, that kind of thing. The risk is incredibly minimal because we don't have air superiority. We have air infinity over mm -hmm. any group like ISIS that doesn't have the capability of mounting any group. Like, we had a, we had air ISIS. superiority over Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, yeah. and they were able to hide out in spider holes and caves mm -hmm. and everything. Oh, I'm not saying I'm not there. saying that. I'm saying risk to. I'm the, saying the, risk to the US risk is though. Interesting. If they see themselves as being stalled in the Middle East, mm -hmm. what's to keep some of these uh, multinational mm -hmm. people who've gone over there and volunteered their services mm -hmm. to coming across to, you know, uh, an allied country and committing acts of terrorism there, mm -hmm. taking it to the shores? I mean, that's that seems like that's the natural progression here. Is if we're stalled in Syria, we might as well try to do some harm somewhere else, and we can yeah. see that. And there's also a very different angle on this in as much as why do they have to be our ground troops if, we're, if they're going to be anyone's? Yes, why can't our NATO, our NATO allies that are in Europe that have a very, have, have absolutely a much more direct need to have for stability in this area to put their money where their mouth is and bring their own troops in? There is no reason that that people like the, like the Turks should not be the ones b bearing the burden of this war that is in their own backyard, forget, as opposed to us. Forget the Turks. Where are the Saudis? Mm -hmm. Where are the Jordanians? I mean, these people are right on their border, and they're next. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's part of the problem, like you said. It's not going to be solved. This, this has been going on for thousands of years, mm -hmm. Sunni-Shiite issues. And, you know, the, the kingdom of, of Saudi is afraid that they'll find themselves being targeted. So are all the other governments. And uh, it's it's a catch-22, like you said. Yeah. I mean, we're damned if we do, damned if we don't. I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, and we'll answer as many as we can live on air toward the end of the program. Also this week, Scotland held a referendum on whether to break with Great Britain and form its own nation. At this time, it appears that the Scots have voted to stay within the United Kingdom. Nick Zayas, all things considered, did the Scots make the right decision? I think they they did for in the short term. Um, voting no was absolutely the right thing for the Scots pocketbooks. There will be the prospect of independence was a very big and very costly experiment that they had the option to vote for, and by and large, older generations of Scots that have a lot more to lose in the short term if things go sour. They voted absolutely against the referendum, but younger Scots did not. Younger Scots voted overwhelmingly for, for independence, and, and that really does show that there's kind of a major generational shift going on, but the people who have the most to lose absolutely overwhelm the people who had the least to lose from independence. Your thoughts, James? Um, I sort of agree. It was, it was largely, I mean, it was... It seemed to be less a referendum on independence of Scotland and more a referendum on the Westminster government. You've got a government in, of the UK right now that's significantly the right of the Scottish population in general. They want control of the national health care program. Uh, they want to fund a large uh, welfare state through the offshore oil rigs. I think what you had was a, was a sentiment against the Westminster government, but not nearly enough of a sentiment to, to justify sort of breaking up the United Kingdom and, like you said, having what, whatever chaos there may have been in the short term. Al, your thoughts? Scotland, I think, was going to be a test case not only for um, Scottish independence, but also for small separatist groups across Europe and the world, the Kurds, um, you know, and uh, certain uh, nationals within um, within the, uh, within the enclaves within other countries, you know, like um, Hungarian Serbs, for example. But um, I think also. This was going. This is one of those things which I believe stopped um, separa separatism, especially in Spain. This past weekend, one of the largest um, monetary operations in the world flew a separatist flag. FC Barcelona wore a jersey which resembled the Catalan flag, um, cel celebrating Catalonia, which is um, a, a distinct society within. Spain. Their opponents the last weekend was Atletico of Bilbao, who wore the colors of the Basque nation. 
And the Bass Nation are people who would stop not would stop at nothing to be able to get separatism from uh, from the Kingdom of Spain. Um, I think the Scotland vote, I think, has put some of these sep separatist movements on ice for a little while. But uh, give the people a chance, and um, you know, in terms of um, you know the next uh, monetary downturn, who knows what can happen? Leaf. Just as a disclosure, my great grandmother was born in Scotland, so I have <laughs> Scottish ties. Uh, I think it was the, it was the right thing to do. Uh, you know, I think more or less because it's a younger generational move towards independence. That's also based on a dream, a theory, uh, something that they think will give them uh, more of an identity somehow. But I, I think they're completely wrong. I mean, you know, there's probably some type of ideal that we could we could ditch all responsibilities for our own defense because, hey, if we're invaded, England would have to come and kick those invaders out so we could save lots of money there and we'll take over all the oil fields in the Northern Sea and everybody else. And it, it was all a pipe dream. Um, oh. And, and so the, same, the same as the pipe dream for the Quebecois. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They secede, they lose all the NAFTA mm -hmm. negotiations and we would just, along with our Canadian yeah. partners, and I think that you take them down. Yeah, and I, and I, I agree with you. I think it would have been. A, I think it would have been a poor political and economic decision uh, for Scotland. But I think that what you're going to see both with in, in regions like Catalonia and regions like the Basque region in Spain, uh, Quebec, uh, Quebec in, in Canada, I think uh, Scotland, Wales. Uh, I think you're going to see a continued devolution of authority. Uh, a sort of pseudo federalism that you're going to sort of pull together as you sort of devolve a certain level of authority back to these independent regions, and that's going to go on over time. And I wouldn't call the referendum a bargaining chip. But it certainly has the effect of, of, of certainly has that effect of, of getting Scottish Parliament's going to have a lot more power now. Definitely, they promised definitely it, and they're going to demand it now. And they're going to come uh, back to them. Right. What it what it does for the uh, the Tory government and and the government in Westminster mm -hmm. remains to be seen when the next elections are called for. It's going to be interesting. I think the the UK elections are going to whenever they're. How long do they have until they have to be called? It's know. not that long. Not that long. You're prime minister, I, mean, I, yeah. I believe it's next year. Is it next year? It's within every five. Mandatory? I just don't know how long yeah. it's been. Yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's going to be about to be soon, and yeah. I don't think it's going to give it enough time for that to that, fade that away. bad taste in your mouth to right. fade away. Exactly. So I think yeah, you're going to have a long, you're going to have a little bit of a it's, backlash. We'll be seeing a Labour government in the UK after the next election cycle, mm -hmm. almost guaranteed. Okay. Elsewhere this week, there were developments in the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. First details emerged about the peace deal between the two countries. Kyiv moved into a closer union with Europe, but at the same time, parts of eastern Ukraine will have greater autonomy and could possibly move closer to Moscow. Then, Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko traveled to Washington, where he asked Congress and the President for greater military aid to fight Russia. Two questions, Mr. Hedrick. First, did Kyiv give up too much to the Russian separatists, and will Poroshenko's trip to Washington turn out to be fruitless? Uh, will we have peace in our time, uh, if that's the question? Um, I don't think that they gave up too much to the Russians because I think we're, we're going back to the ISIS. We're in a rock and a hard place, and there's another rock on the other side. Uh, you've got to be able to stop the, I think, uh, at least for the Ukraine, you've got to be able to staunch the bleeding. You've got to be able to turn your, turn your country that's had a couple of revolts now and a couple of revolutions now into a stable system in the north part of the Ukraine before you can talk about being able to control uh, the southern part and the part that's that's largely pro-Russian at this point. I think that if you've got if you're facing rebels, you know, in the Russian part, I don't think that Ukraine has a problem of coming back. And I think three years is the length of time that they gave on this agreement. Uh, I think if you're facing Russian, that's another question entirely. And I think that if we go to I think if we go to threats to the United States, Russia, uh, you know, beating its chest in in that part of the world again is a bigger issue, I think, generally speaking, than ISIS. Uh, on the trip to the Ukraine, uh, they're not going to get guns and bullets, but apparently Syrian rebels are, which makes me question who we're giving guns to. But um, I think that you're probably going to see a little bit more uh, support from NATO and a little bit more support from some independent countries within, from some countries within NATO, I think, to the Ukrainians. And you've seen the Ukrainians recently with the Polish and the Lithuanians gather together sort of a regional, I think, defense compact. I think you'll see more of that going forward. I think, you know, whether they gave too much, they gave what they had to give in order mm -hmm. to get to buy some time. Yeah. But let's call it what it is. Putin has basically annexed a portion of of the Ukraine as he wants. I mean, there was this uh, comments supposedly he made to the president of, of Ukraine that uh, in, in three or four days he could be in the capitals of several European countries 
you know, <laughs> with the snap of his finger. And, you know, for a couple of the ones that he mentioned, he probably could. He could probably be in the capitals of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania and put them under his thumb if he wanted to pull the Everyone pull that, yeah, um, and you know, I think he's quickly being cornered into a position economically, where you know the only card he'll have left to play to maintain control is this is for the greater good of Mother Russia. We need to mm -hmm. we need to reunite our people here, and uh, you know, he's 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 a nut job. <laughs> I mean, I think he's really. I, I actually, over. I, I think the I think the the more worrisome thing is that Putin's not a nut job. I think he's incredibly rational. I think that's the worry. That, I think that's what we should be more worried about. Is he's not a nut job. He's incredibly rational, and he's playing on Russia's sort of long term historical fears. Yeah. And now the thing is that right now he's targeting non NATO countries, right. well, and I mean, that's and that's the key. Is he's targeting he's, he's, countries. He's clearly a narcissist. I mean, the man, you know. Wrestling with, tigers I, and everything noted, else, you know. I, 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 I've never known a dictator that was humble yeah, and well, you know, this is true, like, you, you know, know. But you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I think you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it scares me to think that we're giving guns to people in Syria, and we won't sell, you know, advanced military mm -hmm. equipment to the Ukraine, who we promised. Our mm -hmm. government signed a treaty with these people that if they gave up their nuclear weapons, we would be there to protect their sovereignty. And that mm -hmm. has just flown out the window. So I would say to everybody who owns nuclear weapons now on a nation basis, never give them up. Why would you? It's a, it's a lose-lose situation. Nonproliferation has just gone down the toilet in the last decade or so. And uh, I don't see any organization out there, especially the UN, which has been shown to be uh, a toothless organization, especially when once somebody on the Security Council decides to, you know, use military force to well, get their way. Mean. So, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it, non-proliferation, I would, you know, uh, it, it, it's just a bad situation. It is. I think the only counter, I, mean, I think the only counterpoint to that is that this is still a better option than World War One, no. which is what you get into the point of where you start, um, where you start requiring there being overwhelming response to overwhelming responses is in the assassination of an archduke, you mm -hmm. know, and it gets us into you know, it gets us into a World War One situation in Europe. It's messy. It's not perfect. It's not, uh, you know, it's not an automatic response, but it's not, it's not a, a spreading. But I guarantee in three years, there, these won't be rebels. These will be Russian soldiers being paid by the Russian government in. Ukrainian rebel uniforms. <laughs> I, I, it's possible. I think I still think that in three years you're going to have a you you have the possibility of having a much more coherent and much more solidified Ukrainian government in the north. And I think oh, you know, yeah. the portion not Russian portion of Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think that you've got a Russians that are going to prop up economically that portion of Russia. I think that it's going to you're going to start to see a real dichotomy there. And that, that is the that, and grace. the economy question is the big question of all of this. Mm -hmm. If all if these new or this move by Ukraine to integrate further with Europe actually works out, mm -hmm. then it will just exacerbate the the economic divide Please. between Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine. And honestly, at if that's the case, and Western U Ukraine really does does not necessarily prosper, but not stagnate as as the country really has, and Eastern Ukraine continues to stagnate as it as its backward economy mm -hmm. that's integrated with the largely backward Russian economy continues to, to sit there and do nothing, there is there is not a whole lot of need for them to even particularly... The, the, the demand to actually want, like, keep Eastern Ukraine as part of a highly centralized, non-devolved as it is today um, system is kind of squishy at best. Mm -hmm. That while like the economic divide in Ukraine is very real and there's no ne there's not necessarily a need to do as Germany did with East Germany and and integrate the backward eastern economy into the largely successful western side of the country it's it's yes it, there's a whole lot of security concerns there but at the end of the, the day the economy is what's going to dictate the stability of the country as it as it does in almost every country I don't know. I mean, could we be looking at a new North and South Korea? I mean, yeah. the, the, you look at North Korea e economy. I, I, I don't. I, <laughs> I don't mean, see I don't Eastern Ukraine being ever ever being able to cut itself off from the world to the extent that that North Korea really has. That I don't think that's a yeah. pretty, a very apt comparison. I don't think there. I don't think particularly anal, you know, analogous situations are not sort of cut off like that. There's not sort of a dictator you know, sit, 
you know, situation like there is. But I think that you got to point in that the economic, if the economic integration in the Ukraine happens and it ties itself, the, the Kiev government ties itself back to Europe and it, it's its trade going and it, still, it stabilizes its economy. If it does all of those things, trade's going to flow and it's going to prosper and the other part's not. Because let's face it, you're, I think you're right, the Russian, you know, sort of oligarchy economy is not going to make that part of the region prosper. Now, what happens when those two come back in three years and one is sort of calmed down and become a bit more stable and the other hasn't? Are we going to get more conflict or are we going to get a desire for the two to reunite? Or are we going to get Eastern and Western Germany and there's, there's separation between those? I don't think in North, South Korea, but I think a certain separation is probably the more likely outcome. Al, some thoughts? Let's <sighs> wait three years, but... Uh uh, I, I just don't see anything that's happened this week that's going to bring anything, the situation, back to status quo ante. No. I really don't. No. Finally, another big story this week was about an NFL player's off-the-field conduct. Minnesota Vikings running back Adrian Peterson was accused of child abuse for allegedly beating his son, young son with a switch. He says that's how he was disciplined as a child himself. Al Matei, to what extent does Peterson's own upbringing excuse what he did to his son? The question on the floor is actually pretty simple. There's no justification for it. Abuse is abuse, whether it's child abuse or domestic abuse or uh, anything inside the home. This issue this week really hit home for me because I saw the photos and I recognize the blood patterns. I recognize the pattern from a pine switch because I myself was hit by pine switches as family discipline in Mississippi in the 1970s. Of course, this is a different time before the whole thing with Benjamin Spock took hold. Um, and yes, I came out relatively okay, unscathed because of this, but um, when we're talking about um, you know Peterson here, we're talking about a person who has had multiple children out of wedlock and he has tried trying to be a professional athlete and an absentee father to more than one family. And when that kid acts up with, without him, what's he going to do in terms of parental skill? The, he has not been taught very, you know, taught very much through his upbringing. Abuse, much like poverty, much like divorce, is something that's intergenerational it, it, and, and teen pregnancy. Once a generation within a family experiences one of those issues, it's very easy to pass it along to the next generation. An abusive father will abuse a son who will grow up to be an abusive father again. And this is one of those things that, um, you know, it's, ver it's been very tough for me to try and get, a whole, get hold of because the Peterson situation is part of an overall pattern, not only with, within the Amer you know, not only just the African American community, as it has been discussed in several media outlets this week, but also with the uh, within the American fabric and also within the National Football League. As the Peterson situation is one of a number of scandals that has hit within the past week. Fortunately, at the end of uh, the the end of t today, being being um, you know, in September of 2014, there was a news conference this afternoon in which Roger Goodell laid out um, a committee for uh, personal conduct. But when you think about it, however, what is the NFL? What is football? Violence followed by committee meetings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I, 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 I don't use it at my house, I guess, um, but I was brought up with, you know, corporal punishment. I was paddled at school. I went to a private school. I wasn't hit with a switch, but my parents did it in a different way. You never strike out and use corporal punishment when you're angry, which is what generally brings it on. You know, your child done something, they knocked something over, they broke your Heisman Trophy or whatever, or your NFL, <laughs> and you grab <laughs> a switch <laughs> and you start wailing on him. Now, this is a grown man who's big and strong, and this was, what, a, a, a child under five, I believe? Four years old. Four years old. Four years old. Yeah. And, and, and the use of a switch, 
that that's I mean it, it's it's it is what it is. It was abuse. He did it while he was angry. Mm -hmm. He didn't he didn't take the time if you could. I mean I don't think you use corporal punishment on a four year old anyways because they don't have the ability to understand. But if you're going to do that, you should have a child who's of age to understand it. Sit them down, explain to them what's going to happen, and then if it's your choice to use some sort of a corporal punishment, whether it's your hand or hopefully it is your hand and maybe. For me, it was always the belt, but uh, not the buckle in, but the, the, the kind of the strap. But I was always explained to me, this is what you violated. We've explained it to you before, and nothing seems to have worked, so this is what's going to happen. Um, I have no problem. If that was his upbringing and he said that's what he did, I would, I would be looking at this as a little different. But the child's age, his size, the use of, of, a, of, a, uh, of a hickory switch or a pine switch. I mean, I, my great-grandmother, the Scottish one, went after my cousin and myself one day with a with a switch off the tree but um i agree it was a generational thing but uh you know he i, I just don't think he has any excuse the idea that this was his choice as a parent to use this type of uh correctional corporal yeah. punishment with a four-year-old child with the switch yeah. There's just no excuse for it. No, uh, I, and, uh, no, and I agree, and I don't. Wanna, I don't want to make light of the situation, but let, let's realize that we arrested and indicted a professional football player in Texas, where I'm from, and I live down there. That's news. That's a big deal. This is not a. I mean, that more than anything proves to me that this is not a small issue. This is not a. Uh, I'm surprised that they they went that far to do it, but they indicted him, and that's the thing. And and I agree, there are some mitigating factors if there's history and stuff like that. But there's a lot more mitigating factors that it's a really bad that it was that it was that it was abuse, and it, it may give some minor excuse to it, but it doesn't justify it. The interesting thing was that the, mm -hmm. as I understand it, the grand jury did not come back with an indictment mm -hmm. the first time, not <laughs> so, the first time. So, yeah. the, so and it, it was up to the uh, the DA, the, the DA to, to bring the charges to bring the charges, so, but, yeah. which I think actually may be more surprising than that the yeah. the grand jury didn't. Uh, this is Texas. No, I I agree with largely everything that was said. I really don't want much to add to this scenario. I think everyone addressed it really, really well. You know, I, I just think I, in tying this, these, this let's let's not just blame professional athletes and football players mm -hmm. and African Americans. You know, for for the, this happens around the country oh, yeah. daily. Yeah. Um, and I I hope hopefully what can happen and what can come from this is not a not an attack as we're seeing now on. Oh, the NFL is just this evil organization that's tax exempt, and we need to yank that from them, and we need to <laughs> have the government show them how things are done, and that we won't tolerate this type of, you know, locker room, uh, boys club type of thing. That would be a waste of this org of, of of taking this this opportunity to explain and hopefully get some teaching, like you said, mm -hmm. to people who are going to be parents or are parents now, that this is not how you parent. Hitting your child with a switch when they can't understand what's going on is not parenting. And if you find yourself in this situation, maybe we can, you know, come up with a way of guide them to where they can go to get help. Mm -hmm. yeah, if anything, this has brought just, uh, it sh it's shined a lot of light on a very real issue in America that you don't actually see every day. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those things that the public consciousness or tries to ignore. As a as a fact of the culture of this country, and if, and I think that having the twenty four seven news coverage of the of this issue has actually done a lot more to help this country. Not not that the not that this this situation was a good one at all, but that because it was covered so heavily and and that it was so horrible that it will probably. Work. Or allow some people to come forward and, and admit the problems that are happening. Um, I kind of also want to bring in, you know, a, a bit of an issue when it comes to st the state interests in all of this. Um, we're talking about Montgomery County, Texas, and I don't know how many meth labs there are there. I don't know <laughs> quite what the crime. Few. I don't know what the crime rate is <laughs> over there, but. A lot of people for there to be much. A, a lot of resources are being used on this one thing. And I'm going to juxtapose this with the story that came out this just this past week in in Austin, when um, child protective services and the police were sent to a mother's home in Austin, and questioning a six year old boy about drugs, about pornography, and about alcohol simply because the mother allowed the child to play in the neighborhood alone. 
what is the state interest in raising the child in term of, or, or telling the parent what to do? Mm-hmm. Shouldn't it be up to the parent and not, and, and yes, some people may say it, take, it takes a village, but do you really need, um, you know, some overseer to say, hey, you know, you, you, you can't uh, let your child ro- ro- roam more than 100 feet from your house. Uh, there, there's no legal justification for this at all, and yet it's happened in Austin, it's happening in Montgomery County, Texas, it's happening in too many places across this country. You know, sometimes you got to let parents be parents, but don't lose sight. Abuse is abuse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts on the topic? Not entirely sure. I think, I think, we'll I think we'll we got move time on. for it. But, yeah. <laughs> no. We're uh, at the time of our program where we'll take some questions from our viewers. Feel free to jump in if you have a response. Uh, our first is from Joanne Benson. How come Scotland is allowed to vote for its independence, but Northern Ireland is not? Actually, that's a really, really interesting issue. I've, I've been reading a lot about Northern Ireland this week. And honestly, while this, this deal was brokered, to allow for this vote on Scottish independence after the Scottish Nationalist Party took power in, in Scotland mm-hmm. and the, in the Scottish Parliament having after their previous devolution. But in the case of Northern Ireland, there's there seems to be growing discontent with the Northern Irish part of the Union on the, on the other side. It le- it's less the upwelling within Northern Ireland for independence, but more the upwelling within the UK that they don't really have much of an interest in Northern Ireland, that that, that the fiscal transfers to the Northern Irish are very real. They, they don't really like that they're subsidizing the Northern Irish. They, they're kind of sick of the Northern Irish politics that is largely religion and based and things like that. They want, they wish that these people would just kind of be members of, uh, like normal members of parliament and vote on national issues along national issue lines as opposed to religious Irish lines. Um, as they kind of currently do, so it's it's a very interesting situation. As much as they don't necessarily have, it, it's not that they really want a vote per se. There hasn't been a real a really major push for for Northern Irish independence at all. Mm-hmm. Our next question, unless anybody wants to chime in on that, is from Matt Floyd. If other Middle Eastern states won't take the lead in fighting the Islamic State, isn't that an indication that it's not as big a threat as we think it is? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I you know, I guess if you say, well, in the in the big scheme of things, is three people being beheaded anything that we should worry about here? Yes. I mean, these are fanatics, and one thing you can count on a fanatic is they're probably find lots of people to strap bombs on themselves or get themselves sick with some type of Ebola disease, have enough money to get themselves across the water to come across the borders into our country and, uh, you know, do something nasty. And, uh, you know, it, just this weekend in, Aus- in Australia, they broke up a, uh, a group of kind of ISIS, ISIL supporters who were going to behead somebody, videotape it in Australia, and put it up on the Internet. So it, it leads to these type of things. I think this is, it's an organization and an ideal that needs to be crushed. Uh, is it an indication because nobody there is willing to step in? I think it's an indication that this is an ongoing thing that's been going on for thousands of years and nobody wants to risk their power structure in going after them. Uh, sure, I think, you know, it's the same way that, you know, Afghanistan slowly, you know, was in, was taken over by the Taliban. Nobody thought, well, we'll just keep them in their borders. They don't stay within their borders. They use it as a place to jump off from. Uh, I think that well, I, I think that it, I think that it doesn't indicate that they're not a threat to the to the region. I think it indicates that the most of the countries in the region either are in chaos right now, i.e., Syria, or are using the, most of their state power to repress their own folks, and that it's hard to it's hard to take any it's hard to take any uh, military uh, power and put it to ISIS when you're using most of your state power to repress your own people, and, and there's a lot of that going on in that area of the world. I still don't think that there's. Uh, as much of an international threat from ISIS or, or terrorists in general, the people that are fanatics and that are willing to go blow themselves up are not the type that plan well-executed terror attacks. Uh, our, th- our threat from ISIS is not from over the Rio Grande Valley, a la my uh, former governor from my beloved home state. Uh, <laughs> but they are a threat. Um, I think there's ways to deal with that threat that are, that are a little bit better than, than, uh, than ground troops and, and invasion. Any thoughts, the questioner actually makes an excellent point. Think about it. You've got immensely rich countries, Qatar, 
United Arab Emirates, um, Oman, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, they should actually, instead of spending money on enormous buildings and hotels and cars, well, why have as the, as the, not, the money not been plowed into self-defense? You know, the greatest armies, navies, and uh, and and ship and, and, and there's and like the world. fourteen people in those countries except Saudi Arabia, <laughs> which has got some mm -hmm. own people, but it's doing its own. It directs its state power to repression mm -hmm. for Qatar, for Yemen, for the United Arab Emirates. There's like twelve people. They have to import mm -hmm. labor to build those giant buildings. The reason they don't have a military is they don't have any people. Mm -hmm. You'd have to hire mercenaries and well. Go back to the Roman. We have to go back to you know yeah. the Roman Empire for how that goes down. Mm -hmm. But like you know, the reason they don't have self defense, if they're larger countries, is usually because they're mm -hmm. they're controlling their own folks. And if there's smaller countries and they're rich, there's nobody to fight. See, it, 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 it's a it's a problem that in that part of the world cuts really deep, and, and people here mm -hmm. have a hard time understanding it. And it's the difference between Sunni and Shiite mm -hmm. Islam. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one has been always picking on the other, and when the other one can have the chance, they return the favor and, and pick on them. Yep. And that's what is driving this thing. <coughs> uh, besides a twisted idea of what Islam is, mm -hmm. uh, and this this idea of a of a giant caliphate that will run from Indonesia into probably back into the Moorish aspects of Spain somehow and mm -hmm. the entire northern part of, of, of Africa, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, Sharia law will guide everybody and... Uh, Manifest you know, destiny. Exactly. At least. Yep. So yeah. and that, that's what's got, and it's hard for us to grasp it, um, and I don't think there's really anything we can use as an analogy here that people would grasp, but... Uh, Manifest know. destiny. Yeah, well, or maybe Yankees Boston. <laughs> For at least the for the for the for the yeah for the fanatics yeah for the fanatics right so you know it's and I you know I hate to make light of it but it's just it's just hard for us to put we can't put a handle on it it's just we see it as a bunch of crazy people doing horrible horrible things and we we ask ourselves why and why should we get involved and and the thing is there is a long history of it and one group just doesn't want to. Take but the re and and this I'm just going to bring one last one last point on that. One of the reasons that you have people willing to be to have that much rage and to be willing to throw themselves back and forth in this constant fight is because of the overwhelming amount of inequality that there is in that region. All right, if you talk about Qatar, you talk about Yemen, you talk about the United Arab Emirates, you talk about the the Saudi Arabians. There's a lot of money coming mm -hmm. through there. None of it's going to anybody any of the people. It, it's being no. very tightly controlled and very tightly held and there's a lot of rage. Now a lot of it gets misdirected to religious fanaticism and to people like ISIS and to things like that. But you've got an under, you've got a problem undergirding this that you can try to address or that you can do a little something about that, that, that you can do more about I think than the, the religious questions. Which well I mean I think you touched on it, you know, the mm -hmm. president in his speech which I wasn't a big fan of. Um, Surprise if you were anybody, you but uh, exactly, <laughs> I you know he he said this is not Islam, but it is. These are at their core Islamic people who believe, and that's mm -hmm. what the the people in 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 Ireland when they were fighting for their independence, mm -hmm. they you know were highly you know suppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, they resorted to violence, bombs mm -hmm. in public places, killing civilians, which was mm -hmm. awful. But you did not find them with the same idea belief that. The Pope wanted them to strap bombs to themselves and walk into a marketplace and blow themselves up. Mm -hmm. These people are being fed a twisted version of Islam that tells them that they will have virgins waiting for them when they die if they do this. Mm -hmm. And somebody that has a very mm -hmm. horrible, horrible life ahead of them and have seen it mm -hmm. generation after generation, 27 virgins and death probably 47. isn't too... Is it 47? Is it 47 or 72? Uh, one of the two, whoever. I guess it depends on how many you mm -hmm. take with you on the way out. But... Uh, it, it's it is they they are Islamic and but you, that's what makes some of this stuff acceptable to these people. But you can find the fanaticism I think in any in any sort of belief system. It's not that it necessarily comes strictly from from an interpretation of Islam. There is a particularly fanatical interpretation of Islam that is undergirding most of this. But you can find that sort of violence and that sort of uh, fanaticism and anything. It's just that it's larger there, and I think that one of the reasons that it's that it's a larger issue there is because there is a sort of widespread amount of repression. And I'm not saying they're not targeting, they're not using it as a soft to, to get people to ignore the fact that they're uh, well, generally getting screwed. But, um, you know, I, I don't think it's specific to the, I don't think it's specific to the religion. 
Mr. Zayas, uh, last word on the topic? Uh, I, w I would say that, yeah, that it's just always... Well, it's always important to keep in mind that these people are very are not crazy, per se. They're very much rational actors who are, who are responding to the incentives that they have in place. Yes, these people are often living hopeless, miserable lives because they, they're being ruled by kleptocrats, fueled by oil money that is being absolutely poorly spent. And they see the... Not the, if you're a kleptocrat. Eh, yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there's going to be a whole lot of different factors that are playing into this. And they're, mm -hmm. and, and they're just they're trying to do what is exactly the, that, what they see as their very best option. And their very best option in this case is, is going to be a whole bunch of really, really bad choices. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they're making that decision, but it's not... But you don't really know exactly what the necessary, that final impetus is, that marginal thing that pushes them over the edge to any, any given um, decision. Okay, we're at that point in the program where we talk about our most underreported stories of the week. We're going to start it off with Mr. Zayas. So what is your underreported story of the week? Uh, I would say the wonderful report out of the Tax Foundation this week, the International Tax Competitiveness in Index, which was which ranked the U.S. 32nd out of 34 OECD countries based on its tax system. Its, its national competitiveness is weak at best. The only two countries in the OECD that score worse than us are Portugal and France, and both of which are, are working on fixing their systems. So next year when this, these rankings come out, the U.S. might be dead last, and that would be just embarrassing. Um, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. It's it's a really terrible system. Then we we tax income from our citizens and making working abroad. So there's a whole lot of factors that are dragging the U.S. down on, on these issues, and it's making it just really hard to make a living in this country, if, or at least for a business to make any sort of profit. I'm shocked that the Democrats didn't bring that up. Wow. <laughs> Mr. Larson, your turn for the underreported story of the week. I don't know if it's so much underreported because the story appeared in the in the Washington Post, so there was a major push towards it. But it, it, it's 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 shocking. There was a report that came out that said sixty three, sixty four percent of people that they polled, and there was a large polling group across the country, had no idea that there were three separate branches in the American government. And these are all voting age people. We have over 63% of the people who cast votes in this country who did not know that there were three separate branches of government. I'm hoping everybody watching this understands that there's the legislature, the, 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 uh, the judicial, and the executive. But these are people who are making decisions for our next set of elected officials. And it's just, it, it, it makes me want to hang my head and, and really hope that Vote, voter turnout stays low because hopefully the people that do vote and turn out on a regular basis do know that there's three groups of people out there. I mean, somebody should explain to them what, what who the congressman they're voting for, what he actually does and where he does it. So uh, I, I don't know. That's my underreported <laughs> story. James? I'm a political scientist and a former professor of government at, at uh, community college, and no, they don't. <laughs> uh, no one does. Uh, and there's reasons for that, but that'd be an entirely different show. Uh, my underreported story of the week, the iPhone 6. Uh, no. Uh, a Russian beer company just bought my beloved Lone Star beer. Where are my economic sanctions when you need them? Pat's company was sold to a Russian company. Lone Star beer is now no longer in Texas. Well, it hasn't been made in Texas for a while, but it's now no longer. Uh, Couldn't we have classified that as a national interest? In I would love to have classified <laughs> that as a national interest, except that you probably never had Lone Star beer. It's really not that no. great. Shiner, on the other hand, is, is where it's at. Yeah. Mr. Matei. My underreported story of the week is a great step forward for women in political journalism in this country. Susan Glasser was this week named editor of Politico. She is a person who has worked at the Financial Times, the Washington Post, and a few other places. She's very tough minded, she's intelligent. She is also very incisive and quite prescient. She once wrote a book with her husband, Peter Baker, um, called Kremlin Rising. It was about Vladimir Putin and his tendencies towards being autocratic. This was Friends in 2005. 
nine years later, she's been proven right. And hopefully she'll do great things at the head of Politico. Did Sarah Palin help her write the book? Because Sarah Palin said she called that, too. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's looking from where? Exactly. Front she porch. could see it happening from mm -hmm. her front porch. I would, yeah. No. All right, well, I will make any Palin jokes. <laughs> thank our panelists, and that is going to do it for us this week. Thanks for watching The Square Circle, and we'll see you next week.